last week we were looking at the letter from the standpoint of ministry and we were in specifically Ephesians 4 1 through 16 and what we have uh, what we've said about this particular section is um, by way of, again, by way of just overview, is that Paul addresses um, first the, first the expectation. expectation, and that's verses 1 to 6, and then the exaltation, which is found in verses 7 to 10. No, 7 to 11. Seven to eleven, and then finally, the explanation. Verses twelve through sixteen. Now, last week as we were moving through this, um, it you know kind of talked about this whole idea in the second area, actually the closing verse of the second area, where it deals with the exaltation and, and what have you, we began to talk about the issue of verse 11, and there we talked about the, um, the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And we said a few things about it. First is um, we said that um, um, the the, um, the words apostle, prophet, um, evangelist, pastor, teacher are um, gender specific. Remember we said that, gender specific, and in each case they're male. And then secondly, what we, um, what we did was we talked about the fact that it's not five uh, different gifted men, it's actually four, four, and um, it's, it reads apostles, prophets, evangelists, and then pastor teachers. The pastor teacher being a combined um, a gift, gifting rather, in the heart of, uh, in the life rather, of one person, so it's four. Um, and then we also emphasize the fact that the interpretation of that is found in the fact that the, um, the grammar of verse 11 centers uh, around the word some, and that is in fact the operative word in the passage. All right, now, um, as we were moving through the lesson, uh, it was you know, brought to our attention in the, in the group setting that there are some English translations that say some apostles, some um, prophets, some evangelists, and then it's, the other translations say it, sa it says um, he gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be um, evangelists, and so on. All right, <clears throat> and in doing so, changes the the interpretation of the passage in that. It's not the people uh, that are receiving the gifts, but the verse is em emphasizing the gifts themselves. That changes the, the dynamic of it. All right, so when I went home last week um, at the church, what I did was I spent this week kind of moving through verse 11, both you know, from the sample of the, gr the grammar and the translations and what have you. And the truth of the matter is, is that it is argued, those two points are argued 
um, on both sides, and they have um, they have strong um, uh, what you call it positions on both sides of the issue. In that, in some Bibles and in some commentaries, the gifts the verse eleven would would be like this. It would be, and he gave. And it's some, and then would then would be to be, and then it would be apostles, and then prophets, and then evangelists. And of course, here would be pastor hyphen teachers. All right. So the the um, the uh, some of the translations actually say, and some of the um, arguments say that the way that you interpret that verse is that the issue is it is some, in other words, some as. Apostles, some as prophets, some as evangelists, some as pastor teachers, and that is not—it's um, not necessarily a bad interpretation. It's, in my opinion, in light of what I believe about the, the grammar of the whole section, um, it's not the best, and that's why we kind of pushed that issue last week. And here's the reason why I concluded it's not the best. Go back to verse 8. If you go back to verse 8, it says, Wherefore, he says, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, right? And then says, and gave gifts unto men. See that? Watch. Verse 9, verse 10 in our Bibles are in parenthesis. What that means for us in English is it means that, that it was placed in there, but it does not necessarily continue the statement of verse 8. The continuation of the statement is in verse 11. So actually the section should read, well, should read, it would read like this. Wherefore, verse 8, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. See it? Verse 11. And he gave some. Well, the continuity of that passage has to be connected to the word men and not gifts. Do you see it? The grammar at least in the King James Version, and, and also in the others as well. It's just that what they do is they spend, they spend time um, defining or interpreting the verse separate from the context, the overall context, which is not necessarily the best way to do that. So if you look at verse 8 again, the closing, section, closing clause of verse 8 says, And gave gifts unto men men. And then verse 11 says, and he gave some. Some who? If it is in fact, um, if you're going to look at this isolated, you can say some as apostles, some as prophets, some, and that's, then that'll be fine. But in keeping with the grammar and context of the, of the, of the whole statement, which is what we, we're supposed to do, and gave gifts unto men, the men um, what qualifies this first clause in verse 11, and gave some, it has to refer to the men, not the gifts. Some men, he gave to some men apostles. He gave to some men prophets. He gave to some men um, evangelists, it's, and so on. And so, um, and now, there is another reason why this is important, and that is because the, and you remember I said this to you last week, one of the reasons why this is, uh, the, the verse, verse 11 is interpreted by itself um, and, and kind of 
put out there as some, some to be, some to be, is because of this would be a challenge to what has become known as cessay, cessationism. Cessationism. And verse 11 is um, one of the historic battlegrounds for cessationism. Cessationism means that at a certain point, or rather God did something up to a certain point, and then at, at a certain specific, a specific point in human history, that particular activity of God came to an end, and he started doing something else. And so in an attempt to um, combat cessationism, the um, interpreters began to look at Ephesians 4.11, and rather than interpret it the way that it had been historically, and that is apostles, well, this way, prophets, evangelists, that's evangelists, and then pastor teachers. Rather than interpret it this way, because this way um, connects to the historical flow or movement of the of the New Testament, how the New Testament church began and how it continues. Right? Rather than interpret it this way, because the cessationists actually conclude that God used apostles and prophets, laid a foundation, but then after that separated his work, and after laying the foundation, he no longer needs apostles and prophets. You now have pastors, or rather I should say uh, evangelist pastors, teachers. And they now take up the role of where the apostle and prophet did in the, in the beginning. But you don't need two foundations. You only need one in the church. That is, in the church, that is, you only need one foundation. And consequently, this, this group is no longer necessary. And you have now uh, evangelists, pastors, teachers. All right? And so the, the, this, this would be, this is what, is what cessationism is. God started out doing this this way. He worked his will and got exactly what he wanted done in laying the foundation. But now, since he doesn't need a foundation anymore, the apostles and prophets are no longer necessary, and evangelists and pastor teachers have now come along and taken up the role, right? Now, that would fit in within, you know, he gave some men apostles, he gave some men prophets, he gave some men evangelists, and he gave some men pastor teachers. That would be the overall flow of Ephesians 4, 8 and 11, right? All right, but what the non-cessationism, uh, what non-cessationists are saying is that you can't um, conclude that God is no longer done with this group. And so as an argument to kind of, kind of you know, not so much contradict, but kind of pick up another, uh, another side of the thing, what they do is they, rather than going that way, which would be the historical police, they line it up and uh, up, you know, um, one, two, three, four, straight up and down. So it says, so this way they interpret it. He gave some to be apostles or prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, and for the non-cessationists, the conclusion is, is that God essentially is still using apostles, still using prophets, still using evangelists, pastors, teachers, and so on and so forth throughout the history of the church. And again, that's not necessarily a bad interpretation um, because I am, I believe in this. I believe that if the flow is this way only because of the grammar of the passage. I believe that the context um, is strong enough to say that he gave some men apostles, some men prophets, some men evangelists, some men pastor teachers, and I believe that without accepting cessationism as a, as a, as a foundation or as a truth, Vic, would you open my, or open, uh, no, no, I'm sorry, pal, just go through my office, you can go, it's, it's fine, all right, just, you can go right through my office, it's, it's open, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so, so um, 
and, and I believe this, and I believe it's consistent with the grammar of the passage, and it doesn't lose anything, and I believe it without accepting the idea that there are no longer apostles, no longer prophets, no longer evangelists, no longer pastor teachers. What I, what I argue is that there are no longer apostles like the ones in the New Testament. There, you, you can't, you not, you, you, not, not the original ones. The original 13 um, apostles are um, unique and different all by themselves. In fact, um, in fact, you can't even add Matthias to that particular uh, group effectively because he was not originally selected by by our Lord. He was selected by the church. So technically, Matthias would fall into the category of a Barnabas who was identified as an apostle um, and some of the others who were identified as apostles in the book of Acts who were not a part of the original, the core group of apostles, Peter, James, John, etc. All right. Um, so that, that second group, that secondary group like Barnabas and the others, that secondary group actually opens the door for the possibility of there being apostles today. But again, not um, like the original, the original group. Um, what that means also is that there are no apostles today that have the exact same apostolic authority as the original as the original group, all right? All right, so, and again, the same thing with the prophets. Um, prophets uh, are not necessarily people that um, um, necessarily speak to the future. That can be a part of their work, but um, it's not necessarily um, um, bound or tied to that. Um, a prophet can either uh, foretell, F-O-R-E, foretell, or forth tell, F-O-R-T-H. They can either foretell something that's going to happen in the future or forth tell, which is something that's going on right here and right now. All right, so I just thought I would bring it up because uh, um, the last, uh, last week it was, a, it was a very important point, and I didn't want to just kind of pass over it. I wanted to kind of deal with it a little bit on, on today. All right, does everybody understand what, what, what I'm saying, what I'm dealing with here? Everybody get it, right? Okay. All right, let's move on to the next thing here. Um, morality. The book of Ephesians actually addresses the issue of morality, and that's Ephesians uh, chapter 4. Uh, yeah, chapter 4, verse 17, all the way to chapter 5. Chapter 5, verse 17. Chapter 5, verse 17. So Paul addresses the issue of morality. And the idea behind the, the, um, the discussion of morality obviously has to do with morals. It has to do with morals. And um, one of the most important issues of church life is... Um, the life, the life. Uh, it's not enough to be a church member and be um, clearly identified as a child of God. It's not enough to be a part of a ministry and activity in the church. It's not enough to come to church and be identified um, effectively as a child of God. There has to be an outliving um, of what you say you believe. There has to be an outworking of that, of that particular life. What was true about Jesus must be true about every single person that says they know him or are connected to him. And that is, the word became flesh. And that's what, that's what the Christian life is. 
It is in the life of the child of God. It is daily the word becoming flesh. Right? The truth we believe is to be the thing that we wrap our lives around. And of course, there is no, um, there's no way for any of us to flesh it out and live it out without the power of the Holy Spirit. Who lives inside of us. And the first indication that you are in fact authentically born again is the acknowledging of the fact you cannot live the born again life on your own. You can't do it. Amen? Amen. You can't do it. You cannot live the Christian life. It's impossible. The life of Christ, which is what the Christian life is, the life of Christ is too high for the human heart to rise to. Impossible to get to. You can't. And what Paul does in Ephesians 4, beginning at verse 17, is he starts laying out this truth um, verse 17, he says, This I say, therefore, testify in the Lord, you henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind. Right? Listen, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ. So that there is a difference altogether. Um, that is connected to the life of Jesus Christ. It is a totally different life altogether. It is the opposite of the life we lived prior to knowing him. And none of us. None of us are good enough on our own to live out the Christian life. And so morality is rooted in our yielding to the ministry of the Holy Spirit who lives on in the inside, who is himself given for the express purpose of working out of us the truth of Christ's life. Right? Very important. Very important. It's not in this section and certainly not going to mess up uh, by trying to, you know, make the connection or two, but I'll tell you this. Um, the classic uh, section on this particular passage is Galatians 5, verses 16, all the way down to verse 23. Galatians 5, 16 to 23. Because in verse 16, the Apostle Paul says that he says, walk in the Spirit, right? And you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, right? And then he says, right, the, the Spirit is contrary to the flesh, and the flesh is contrary to the Spirit, right? And then he lays out at verse 19 of Galatians 5, he starts talking about what the works of the flesh are, and he lays out about 19 different things that come through as a result of our bodies and our, our hearts being darkened and all that kind of stuff. And then he says in verse 22, he breaks down and he says, but the fruit of the Spirit. Yes. See? And because, it, because, it, because whatever the Holy Ghost is doing is in contrast to whatever the flesh has done. Right? So the point is, is, that, there, there, is that if in fact you are going to live out the Christian life, and, and manifest the, the level of morality that, that is required of us. That particular life is a life that is ordered by, controlled by, um, applied by, and worked out by 
the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's why it is so important that we have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Very important. Very important. All right. So we jump now down to this other section here of the topic in Ephesians. And that is marriage. Paul spends some time dealing with this issue of marriage. I'm going to start in verse 18. And he actually moves this discussion down to uh, verse 33. And um, he talks about marriage, the importance of it, God's intent in, um, in um, offering it to men, um, and the high, uh, the high um, issue, the high point in place that he's trying to kind of deal with is this idea of um, the unity um, of the relationship between uh, the husband and wife, and all, incidentally, that's all he has in mind when it comes to marriage. Amen. Um, it's all he has in mind when it comes to marriage, the husband and a wife. Amen. Um, he offers no alternative in Scripture to husband and wife. None. All right. There is, there is no husband, wife, plus what? And the reason why you don't have an answer to that is because he doesn't offer any alternative any other. There is no third choice in that dynamic. There's a husband and then there's a wife. And then he gives the reason why. He says the reason why it's just a husband and a wife in the context of the marital relationship, the reason why it's just that dynamic is because the marriage is a mirror that reflects Christ and his church. So that here's what, here's what, here's what Paul argues. Literally, he says, the reason why it's just husband and wife is because the marriage is to mirror or be a picture of Christ and his church. Ultimately, that's what the marriage is supposed to be, a picture of Christ and the church. It is a picture of Christ and the church. Now, anything or any attempt to change that violates the picture. It scars and mars the picture. The husband and the wife are to be a visible expression of a spiritual reality, which is Christ and his church. Paul then says this, the husband is to the wife the exact same thing that Christ is to his church. And that's the reason why the husband has the dominant responsibility to agape his wife, love his wife. Wait a minute, let's take it a step further. John then says, 1 John, John then says, 
if in fact the church, I'm, I'm sorry, the husband and wife relationship is to be a mirror of the supernatural spiritual reality between Christ and the church, then that means that we, follow, we, the, the, we ought to take our cue from that reality. And here's the reality. We loved him, the church loved him, the church loves him because he first, I need Bible readers here, he first loved us. So that if in fact I want my wife to love me unequivocally, then the truth of the matter is, is that I cannot demand from her what I have not put in her. Come on now. Husband, wife, reflection of a spiritual reality, Christ in the church, Christ commands husbands Love your wife even as I love the church. John says, and as a ch the church, in terms of response to that, the church says this, we love you because you first loved us. So then technically speaking, if Christ pours no love into us, he cannot expect from us what he has not given us. And the natural manifestation of that in the physical is, if I have not poured love into my wife, I cannot expect her to give what I have not given her first. Now watch. Take it a step further. If somewhere along the line something gets blurred and something else comes up and something else is created and something else is made up, it violates the picture. It, it mars the picture that we're supposed to represent, which is Christ in the church. And then Paul argues this point. It is inconceivable that Christ would marry Christ. And it's inconceivable that the church would marry the church. And the reason that is, is because there is absolutely no effective response in those relationships. None. Watch this. If all I'm church, the church hooking up with the church for, to have this, you know, relationship or whatever, it literally nullifies all possible. Why? Because all we can produce from each other is what each other has. That's all we have. We can't do nothing else. Christ will not marry Christ because there's only one. There's no one like him. I mean, God the Father, yeah, but God the Father has a place and a role. God the Holy Spirit, they, he's got a place and he's got a role. Not interested. Christ not interested in fulfilling that kind of thing. He's not going to make another Christ and hook up with him. Not going to do it. The divine order is already set in motion and it's set in motion based on a supernatural, invisible reality, which is Christ absolutely, for all eternity, has loved the church. His passion has been his church. And the church becomes his bride, the bride of Christ. It is impossible to imagine that um, Christ would identify Christ as his bride or Christ would identify Christ as his husband. Impossible. The church never looks at the church and says, I love you so much that I want to marry. It never does that because it would nullify the whole 
everything would be nullified. The whole work of evangelism would be nullified. And the same way that that truth is, that, that particular truth is, is, is laid out before us, and the same way we have to look at this whole idea of husband, husband and wife. And that's how Paul lays it out. Wives have responsibility to their husbands. Submission. Husbands have responsibility to their, to their wives, to love. And I, as husband, have no right to expect any level of submission from my wife if I am not first fulfilling the love responsibility. Amen. I know this is not, my, this is not my, my area this morning. I ain't got no business here. But let me tell you this. Wives are responders. Yes. Women are responders. Women are responders. I know I'm going to get in trouble. No, you're right. Women are responders. Women are responders. All right, moving right along. Let me just say this one last time. Women are. There you go. And that's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. That's right. That's right. Look, look. So, um, I walked through the house, kid, coming through the house, and the house clean, right? And um, at a certain hour of the day, um, at least Monday through Friday, Saturday and Sundays were different in our house. Monday through Friday, I walk in, right? House clean, and um, gospel music in the background. Um, every now and then, somebody preaching. My father wasn't big on that. He, 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 you know, every now and then, you had one of them, he sell them albums. Remember them albums, preachers? Anybody remember albums? I'm sorry. Because, you know, everybody, I feel like I'm by myself. <laughs> say that. I said, somebody said, album. What? What is that? <laughs> yeah, had a record player, you know what I mean? So my mom would put on the, put on the, uh, put on the, you know, Clay Evans or somebody like that, C.L. Franklin, something. Every now and then. But usually, you know, a little gospel music playing in the background. You know, on a little radio there, and, and coming out, and you see plates and stuff on the dining room table. Some the Sunday uh, days we would eat at the dining room table. The other time we eat in the kitchen. Either one, she had the plates and stuff out there. You know, <clears throat> and then she said, go upstairs. Same same assignment every 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 day. You know, you go upstairs, you wash up, you finish your homework, you get it squared away. You come downstairs. We gonna have dinner. Your dad'll be home 5:30. Am I the only one? Everybody remember? Right. So, so, and dad be home at 5.30. Right. So, right. And so about 6 o'clock, right, dinner on the table smoking, you know. So I'm like, I'm scratching my head. I'm like, you know, kid, you know. God, I mean, she's like doing this stuff all the time. You turn around and, and then it dawned on me. It got older, you know, throughout my entire life, Right. I don't ever remember my mother opening her own door when my father was around. I never remember my mother carrying bags when my father was around. I never remember my, my mother. I don't, remember, I don't remember my mother doing anything that would quote unquote would be identified as manual. You know what we did as manual when my daddy was around. Now when he was at work and she had to go to the store, she had to carry. You know, but when I got old enough, he made me. He, this, you make sure you get them. <laughs> Pick them back, you know, so I, you know, and of course I do it because I was afraid if he came home and found out I didn't, you know, it'd be a whole nother kind of store. You understand? So when I got old enough, I did. but, but, you know, when he wasn't around, she had to do some stuff. But when she, when he was around, never opened her own door, you know what I mean? Never, it just right on down the line, never, all the time. Every, and, and it dawned on me. That was a manifest. He loved her and refused to let her do stuff that wasn't necessary. And because of that, even when he wasn't around, she was preparing for his coming. Moving right along. That's right. There is a military topic in this particular portion of Scripture. Military topic, military idea. 
In verse 10 of Ephesians chapter 6, the apostle Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then the next verse he says, put on the whole armor of God. Put on the whole armor. Not part of it, but all of it. The whole armor of God. And the reason that is is because we are literally in a war. It's a war. It is, it's a war, y'all. And, and we, you know, we talked about this some time ago. Um, you know, it, the whole conversation of warfare is obsolete. It's, you know, everything now has to do with, you know, cycle, so, you know, analysis and all this whole kind of craziness and, and what have you. And Satan is in the background grinning because while we are popping pills and drinking liquids, <laughs> trying to calm ourselves and get ourselves together, the devil is the one behind the scenes, and we never pay him any attention. And what Paul says is, he says that this is an outright battle, right? Around about verse 11 or 12, the apostle Paul says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. The people that are around you are not your enemies. The ones that are hurting you, they're not your enemy. Listen to me. If you bear the mark of Jesus, whatever that mark is, if you identify with Christ Jesus and he is your Lord and your Savior, beloved, Satan is working overtime to keep you from your advancement. Keep you from advancing. And you do understand that if you don't take Satan serious, then you don't take the armor serious, which means you're not going to put it on. And if you are not dressed you going to get messed up because Satan is not playing. Ephesians 6, verse 12, what does it say? Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. Do you see that verse? The verse is important, and if you've been around any length of time, you, you know what's coming next. The operative words in the verse are not principalities, powers, uh, rulers of the darkness, spirit. That is not. They are not the operative words. Remember what I told you last week. God does not have a speech impediment. He does not stutter. And any time God uses a single word in a single verse, that is his point. The operative word in the verse is against. And because it is not italicized, that means that it was actually in the original document. And what that means to us is against, 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 against. What that literally means is, is that at some point in your life and mine, as a child of God, you are going to run up against one of the four categories of demons mentioned in verse 12. And beloved, those are demons. Classes of demons. That is very revealing too because the verse clearly helps us understand that there are specific demonic um, categories. There are, there are, there are, it's, I, I call it the satanic network. He has at least four classes of demons that work along with him. Some are called principalities, some are called powers, 
Some are called rulers. Some are called spiritual wickedness. Four categories of demonic spirits. Now, there are other times you're going to see the words principality and powers, and they're going to identify good angels. And the reason that is is because when the, when the, when the, um, when the angels fell with Satan, they were already in specific classes. And so literally what the, what the text is saying is that amongst the group of angels that fell, there were those who were principalities, there were those that were a group that are called powers. Right? And they are still identified that way, but they're on the dark side of the issue now. They're on the satanic side of the issue. But no matter what they are, no matter who they are, at some point in your life as a child of God, you're going to run right into them. Because Satan hates God. He hates God. And he hates everything that God loves. Everything that God loves, Satan hates. Now, I'm going to get in trouble with all my Calvinist friends, but I'm going to say it. Satan unleashed his attack on the earth going after man because... Man is the object of God's love. And anything that Satan can do to offend God, he does it through men. And the highest form of insult, as far as Satan is concerned, the highest form of insult is to get the thing that God loves to curse God. To curse him. To curse him. And demons operate in our world. Satanic power operates in our world. And at some point in your life, child of God, you are you have run into these unseen beings and their work. All of us. Satan hates God. And he specifically hates everything that God loves. Amen? All right, so we kind of moved through the book of Ephesians, and uh, as I said last week, we will, we probably, we'll probably come back um, after we finish our survey and... Um, kind of do a little bit more detailed study of the book. It's either, it's either going to be this one or Proverbs, but we're going to do one of the two. All right, let's uh, take some questions. Any questions on the floor? No, 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 that's men, mankind. That's men, mankind. And, and thank you for the because that's what helps with the distinction too. Because, the, because the, the grammar shifts in verse 11. It's no longer mankind. It's specifically men. And that's a good point. I didn't, yeah, thank you. Very helpful. Yeah, and, and again, that's another part of the reason why we take the sum to mean the men and refers back to them because he does change and, he, and, he, and it connects back with the, with the previous statement. Yeah. No, no, no. He gave gifts unto men. In other words, so, 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 so verse 8 says, the last clause says, and he gave gifts unto men. Right, that's mankind. And the idea is, is that the gifts, verse 11, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher, are gifts for the whole body, male or female. You understand? So that, so that the whole body benefits from these specific, specific gifts. See, the, the illustration that Paul uses is actually, it, 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 there is a military dynamic associated with it as well. Because when a... When a um, when a king returned to his homeland and is made the primary city, after a victorious um, battle with another country, what kings would often do, and this is documented, what kings would often do is they would ride in to town. You know, the crier would go ahead and say, the king is coming, the king is coming. So the whole city would become 
you know, excited and celebrative, you know, in light of the fact that the king has returned. And when he came back as conqueror um, and victorious, what usually would happen is the king would have either large sacks of the goods of the, the spoils of the people that were conquered on his horse or there would be people around him carrying the stuff. And what he would do, or he would have them have others assigned to do it, they would walk through the streets by his horse as he's, you know, and they would wave palms and laurels and, you know, welcoming the king back. They would literally take out, scoop out things from, from those, the resources that, and literally hurl them into the crowd, throw them into the crowds of people. Right, and, and this, so, that, so that what they would do is they would, um, they would share the spoils, if you will, of the victory. And the, the, that illustration is what Paul is using in verses 8, um, 9, 10, 11. He's using of a victorious king who gives evidence of his victory by giving the spoils of the victory to the men, or, you know, men and women who were waiting for the king's uh, return, so to speak. Right. right. All right. That's a very good question, and I'm going to give you an answer but you're not going to like it. Okay? Let's be, let's be frank. All right? And let's do something that's odd in church. Let's tell the truth for change. All right? In those moments when I don't, the question is, what do you do when you don't feel like plugging into the Spirit to kind of walk in the Spirit? In those moments when I don't feel, and I'm going to talk about you, I'm using, when those moments when, when I don't feel like plugging in to the Spirit, I don't. And I suffer the consequences for not doing it. All right. So I've been saved now for a minute. And hopefully by now, I've learned that I don't like the consequences for those moments when I don't plug in. And so, what, and so what, what has happened is that my sanctification has been progressive. And I don't fall or do that as often as I used to, but I still do. Because, the, because human nature, the human heart is so deceitful and so corrupt that even with the lessons I've learned, there are still moments when I, I long for the other thing. Or I feel like I can deal with this myself. And in those moments, um, I don't plug in. And in that is, and, and, but the goal is, is you live the Christian life long enough that you learn that there are, there's a need to plug in because the consequences are going to follow every action. You see what I'm saying? Yes. The, 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 the research started about 25, 30 years ago because the, the divorce rate amongst the, amongst the, the church was, was soaring above 40%. And they became concerned because it was catching up. And so, and of course, now it's passed. But um, the, 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 the question, you know, that, that was raised by, um, what's this guy's name? Barna, George Barna, and his researchers, uh, about 30 years, 25, 30 years ago, what they did was they asked the question, what was the, real, the source of the, of the conflict in the context of the Christian home, right? Um, and the argument was, uh, you don't want it to happen, but because the world does not have access to the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit in the whole thing, and the church does, why is it that, you know, there is no you know, uh, lowering rather than in rain. And the response was, and this was, I'm going back at least 30, well, at least 25 years. Um, the response was that uh, the heart of man is deceitful. <laughs> the same question or same thing we've been saying. Um, people don't understand how corrupt we are for real. And we don't, un and because we don't, we don't apply the truth of the ministry of the Holy Spirit to our lives. We don't grasp um, how serious and how necessary 
his work is in every area of our life, in every single area of our life. Um, apart from him, there will be no unity, not only in the context of the church, but there won't be any unity in the context of, you know, relationships, et cetera, that kind of thing. So, um, like, for instance, the, the, you know, I'm, I'm, I gave you these topics, right, and we kind of moved through this. But when you get to verse 18 of, of, of Ephesians chapter 5, right, technically speaking, verse 18 is the starting point for everything that follows, including chapter 6, up to verse 9 particularly. And, and that is, in this section here, what you have is the family unit in this section, right? But it, it, but it doesn't begin with wives submit to your husbands. It doesn't begin with husbands love your wives. It begins with be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. See, and, and so that the controlling influence then becomes the Holy Spirit in the wife, in the husband, chapter 5, then verse 1, chapter 6, the children, right? And then the employer and then the employee, etc. around the line. Because so, you understand? Because, and see what we've done, and, and, and I, my, my, I guess my answer to your question is, is that there is not enough emphasis on an understanding of who the Holy Spirit is and what his real role is. We keep trying to do stuff and mess up. And, and unfortunately, as Sister Armigan was, you know, question is, we, 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 um, we, we, we don't get it. Even years and years and years, well, centuries have gone by, and we still don't, we still don't understand it. You know, we could raise the same question about slavery and the attitudes of, 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 of American society, racism, and the attitudes of American society. And, 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 and early on, the main uh, focal point to all that was the church. You understand what I'm saying? You, he, you got men who are writing constitutions, you know, and inalienable rights and all this kind of stuff for the, for the whole country, right? And then leaving the desk and going to beat a slave on the one hand and then sleep with one on the other. So, so you know, and, and, and they were the ones who said the Bible is the structure, the blah, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. So, you know, it, it's the human heart. We really don't understand just how twisted we are. 